we effectively you can think of as 50 percent of effort is on scaling 50 percent of it is on innovation and i think you my betting is you're going to need both to get to agi i've always felt this that if we build agi and then use that as a simulation of the mind and then compare that to the real mind we will then see what the differences are and uh, potentially what's special um, and remaining about the human mind Demis Hassabis just gave a mind-boggling interview on the arrival of AGI. He actually revealed the entire timeline of AGI's arrival. He shared some shocking insights into what's going to change with the arrival of AGI and what the world is going to look like post-AGI. Let's dive into the interview, and I'll break everything down as we go. The thing that's strange is that, I, I mean, this time last year, I think there was a lot of talk about, um, uh, you know, scaling, eventually hitting a wall about mm. us running out of data. And yet, uh, you know, uh, uh, we're recording now, Gemini 3 has just been released and it's leading on this whole range of different benchmarks. Yeah. Um, how how has that been possible? Mm -hmm. Like, wasn't there supposed to be a problem with yes. scaling, hitting a wall? I think a lot of people thought that especially as other companies have sort of had slower progress, shall we say. But I think we've never really seen any wall as such. Like what I would say is um, maybe there's like diminishing returns. Mm. And people, when I say that, people think, only think like, oh, so there's no returns. Like it's zero or one. It's either exponential or or, not, or it's asymptotic. No, actually, there's a lot of room between those two regimes. And I think we're in the, in between those. So it's not like you're going to double the performance on all the benchmarks every time you release a new iteration. Maybe that's what was happening in the early, very early days, you know, three, four years ago. But you are getting significant improvements like we've seen with Gemini 3 that are well worth the investment and the return on that investment and doing. So I, that we haven't seen any slowdown on. There are issues like, are we running out of just available data? But there are ways to get around that, you know, synthetic data, uh, generating your, you know, these systems are good enough, they can start generating their own data, especially in certain domains like coding and math, where you can verify the answer. In some sense, you could produce unlimited data. So all of these things, though, are research questions. And I think that's the advantage that we've always had is that um, we've we've always been sort of research first. And we I think we have the broadest and deepest research bench always have done. Um, and if you look back at the last decade of advances, whether that's Transformers or AlphaGo, AlphaZero, any of the things we just discussed, that they all came out of Google or DeepMind. So I've always said, like, if, if more innovations are needed, uh, scientific ones, then I would back us to be the place to do it, just like we were, you know, in the previous sort of 15 years for a lot of the big breakthroughs. So I think that's just what's transpiring. And I actually really like it when the terrain gets harder, because then it's not just world-class engineering you need, you, which is already hard enough, um, but you have to ally that with world-class research and science, which is what we specialize in. Uh, and on top of that, we also have the advantage of world-class infrastructure with our TPUs and, mm. and other things that we've invested in a lot for a long time. Um, and so that combination, I think, allows us to uh, uh, sort of be at the frontier of the innovations as well as the scaling part. And we effectively, you can think of as 50% of our effort is on scaling, 50% of it is on innovation. And I think you, my betting is you're going to need both to get to AGI. In the following part, Hasabis explains why we haven't been able to achieve AGI yet and what are the pieces of the puzzle that are still missing to achieve this stage. I think it's fascinating, actually, one of the most fascinating things and probably that needs to be fixed uh, uh, as one of the key things why we're not at AGI yet. Um, as you said, we've had a lot of success and other groups on getting like gold medals at the International Mass Olympiad. You look at those questions and they're, they're super hard questions mm. that only the top students in the world can, can do. And on the other hand, if you pose a question in a certain way, we've all seen that with with experimenting with chatbots ourselves uh, in our daily lives, that it can make some fairly trivial mistakes on logic problems. They can't really play decent games of chess yet, which um, is surprising. So there's something missing um, uh, uh, still from these systems in terms of their consistency. And I think that's one of the things that you would expect from a, a general intelligence and you know, an AGI system is that it would be consistent across the board. And so uh, we, sometimes people call it jagged intelligences. Mm -hmm. So they're really good at certain things, maybe even like PhD level, but then other things, they're like not even high school level. Mm -hmm. So it's very uneven still, the performances of these systems. They're very, very impressive in certain dimensions, um, but they're still pretty uh, uh, basic in others. And we've got to close those gaps. And 
you know, there are theories as to why, and depending on the situation, it could even be uh, the way that an image is is perceived and tokenized. So sometimes actually it doesn't even get all the letters that you, you know, it's when you count letters in words, um, it sometimes gets that wrong, but it may not be seeing that each individual letter. So there's sort of different reasons for some of these things. Uh, and each one of those can be fixed and then you can see what's left. Um, but I think consistency, I think another thing is reasoning and thinking. So uh, we have thinking systems now that at inference time, they spend more time thinking and they're, they're better they're better at outputting their answers. Um, but it's not sort of super consistent yet in terms of like, is it using that thinking time in a useful way um, to actually double check and use tools to double check what it's outputting? I think we're we're on the way, but maybe we're only 50% of the way there. Okay, so in the following part, Hasabis talks about the impact of AGI and how it's going to change everything around us. I mean, this, I guess we're still talking sort of medium to long term yeah. in terms of this stuff. So so just going back to the trajectory that we're on at the moment, yes. um, I also want to talk to you about the the impact that AI and AGI are going to have on, on wider society. Mm. Um, and last time we spoke, you said that you thought AI was overhyped in the short term, mm -hmm. but underhyped in the long term. Um, and I know that this year there's been a lot of chatter about an AI bubble. Yes. What happens if there is a bubble and it bursts? What happens? Well, look, I, I think, yes, that I still subscribe to it's overhyped in the short term still and still underappreciated in the in the medium to long term. What's going to, you know, how transformative it's going to be. Um, yeah, there is a lot of talk, of course, right now about AI bubbles. Um, in my view... Uh, I, I think it, there isn't that there, it's not one thing binary thing are we or aren't we? Mm -hmm. I think there are parts of the AI ecosystem that are probably in bubbles. What one example would be, you know, just seed rounds for startups uh, that basically haven't even got going yet, and they're raising at tens of billions of dollars mm -hmm. uh, valuations just out of the gate. It's sort of interesting to see how how can that be sustainable. Um, you know, my guess is probably not, uh, at least not in general. Um, um, so there's that area. Then the people are worrying about, obviously, there's there's the big tech valuations and other things. I think there's a lot of real business underlying that. Mm -hmm. So, um, but it remains to be seen. I mean, I think maybe for any, any uh, new, tr unbelievably transformative and profound technology, of which, of course, AI is probably the most profound, uh, you're going to get this uh, overcorrection in a way. Mm -hmm. So when we started DeepMind, no one believed in it. No one thought it was possible. People were wondering, what's AI for anyway? And then now, fast forward 10, 15 years, and now, obviously, it's, it seems to be the only thing people talk about in business. And um, so it's, a, you, you, but you're sort of going to get, it's almost an overreaction mm. to the underreaction. Um, so I think that's natural. I think we saw that with the internet. I think we saw it with mobile. And I think we're, we're seeing it or going to see it again with AI. Um, I don't worry too much about are we in a bubble or not because from my perspective as you know leading Google DeepMind and also obviously with Google as, as an alphabet as a whole our job and my job is to make sure we, either way we uh, are come out of it very strong and I think and we're very well positioned and I think we are tremendously well positioned either way so if it continues going like it is now fantastic we'll carry on you know all of these great things that we're doing and experiments and progress towards AGI if there's a retrenchment fine then also I think we're in a great position because uh, we have our own stack with TPUs we also have um, all these incredible Google products and, you know, the profits that all makes to plug in our AI into. And we're doing that with search is totally revolutionized by AI overviews, AI mode with Gemini under the hood. We're looking at workspace, at email, at, you know, at YouTube. So there's all these amazing things in Chrome. There's a lot of these amazing things that um, AI we can see already are low hanging fruit to apply uh, Gemini to, as well of course as Gemini mm. app, which is doing really well as well now, and 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 the you know, idea of a universal assistant. So there's new products, and I think they will, in the fullness of time, be super valuable. But we don't have to rely on that. We can just power up our existing uh, ecosystem, uh, which is all sort of. I think that's what's happened over the last year. We've got that really efficient now. In the next part, Hasabis talks about what life could look like after the arrival of AGI. 
watch this. I think there's a lot of um, incredible advances that came out of Industrial Revolution. So um, child mortality went down mm. and all of modern medicine uh, and and um, sanitary conditions, the kind of work-life uh, uh, split and how that all worked was kind of worked out during the Industrial Revolution. But it also came with a lot of challenges. Like in, it took quite a long time, um, pro- uh, roughly a century. And um different parts of the labor force were dislocated at certain times and then new uh things had to be created new organizations like unions and other things had to be created in order to rebalance that so like it was fascinating to see the whole of society sort of had to over time adapt and then you've got the modern world now so there were i think there were lots of obviously pros and cons of the industrial revolution why it was happening but no one would want if you think about what it's done in total like abundance of you know people you know of food and things in in the western world and and modern medicine and all these things modern transport mm. um that was all because of the industrial revolution so we wouldn't want to go back to pre-industrial revolution but maybe we can figure out ahead of time by learning from it what those dislocations were and maybe mitigate those um, earlier or more effectively this time. And we're probably going to have to because the difference this time is that it's probably going to be 10 times bigger than Industrial Revolution and it'll probably happen 10 times faster. So more like a decade than unfold over a decade than a century. One of the things that Shane told us was that the the kind of current economic system where, you know, you exchange your labour for resources Mm -hmm. effectively, it, it just won't function the same way in a post-AGI society. Do you have a vision of of how society should be reconfigured or might be reconfigured in a way that works? Yeah, I'm spending more time thinking about this now and Shane's mm. actually leading an effort here on that to sort of think about what a post-AGI world might look like and what we need to prepare for. But I think society in general needs to spend more time thinking about that, economists and social scientists and governments, because as with the Industrial Revolution, you know, the whole working world and working week and everything got changed from from pre-Industrial Revolution, more like agriculture. And I think that's going to, at least that level of change is going to happen again. So it's not surprising. I don't, would not be surprised if we needed new economic systems, new economic models to, uh, to basically um, help with that transformation and make sure, for example, the benefits are widely um, distributed and maybe things like universal basic income and things like that are part of the solution, but I don't think that's the complete, uh, I think that's just what we can model out now, right? Because that would be a, 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 almost an add-on to what we have today. But I think there might be something way better systems where um, more like direct democracy type systems where you can, you know, vote with a certain amount of of credits or something for what you want to see. It happens actually on local uh, community level. You know, here's a bunch of money. Do you want a playground or tennis court or an extra classroom on the school? Mm -hmm. And then you let the community um, sort of vote for it, right? So, it, and then, and then maybe you could even measure the outcomes, and then, and then the people that sort of consistently vote for the for for things that that end up being um, more well received, they they have proportionally more influence for the next vote. So there's there's a lot of interesting things I hear, you know, economists, friends of mine who are uh, are kind of brainstorming this, and I think that would be great if we had uh, a lot more work on that. And then there's the philosophical side of it of like, okay, so jobs will change and other things like that, but then, um, but maybe we'll have fusion will have been solved. And so we have this sort of abundant free energy. So we're post scarcity. So what happens to money? Um, maybe everyone's better off, but then what happens to purpose, right? Because a lot of people get their purpose from, you know, their jobs and then providing for their families, uh, is, which is a very noble purpose. So if that's, you know, so there's a lot of, I, I think some of these questions blend from economic questions into almost philosophical questions. Now comes a really interesting question. The host asks Hasabis once AGI arrives, whether there will still be anything humans can do that machines will never be able to do. In the long term, so beyond AGI and, and towards ASI, right, artificial superintelligence, do you think that there are some things that, that humans can do that machines will never be able to manage? Well, I think it's the big question. And I feel like this is related to, as you know, one of my favorite topics is Turing machines. I've always felt this, that if we build a GI and then use that as a simulation of the mind and then compare that to the real mind, we will then see what the differences are and uh, potentially what's special um, and remaining about the human mind. Right. Maybe that's creativity. Maybe it's emotions. Maybe it's dreaming. There's a lot of uh, consciousness. There's Mm -hmm. a lot of 
um, hypotheses out there about what may or may not be computable. And this comes back to the Turing machine question of like, what is the limit of a Turing machine? And I think that's the central question of my life, really, ever since I found out about Turing and Turing machines. And, um, you, you know, I think that's, that's, I fell in love with that. That's my core passion. And I think, um, everything we've been doing is being sort of pushing the notion of what a Turing machine can do to the limit, including, you know, folding proteins, mm. right? And so it turns out I'm not sure what the limit is. Maybe there isn't one, right? And of course, the, my quantum computing friends would would say there are limits and, and you need quantum computers to do quantum systems, but I'm really not so sure. And I've actually, you know, discussed that with some, some, some of the quantum folks. And it may be that we need data from these quantum systems systems in order to create a classical simulation. Um, and then that that comes back to the mind, which is, is it all classical computation or is there something else going on? You know, like Roger Penrose believes, you know, there's quantum effects in the brain. If there are, then, and that's what consciousness is to do with, then machines will never have that. At least the the, the classical machines mm. will have to wait for quantum computers. It, um, but if they if there isn't, then there may not be any limit. Maybe in the universe, everything is computationally tractable, and therefore, tr if you look at it in the right way, and therefore, Turing machines might be able to model everything in the universe. I, I'm currently, if you were to get make me guess, mm -hmm. I would guess that, and I'm working on that basis until physics um, shows me otherwise. So there's nothing that cannot be done within these sort of computational. Well, no one's found. Put it this way: nobody's found anything in the universe that's that's non-computable. So far. So far. Right. And I think we've already shown you can go way beyond the the usual complexity theorist P equals MP view of like what a classical computer could do I I I today, things like protein folding and Go and so on. So I don't think anyone knows what that limit is. And that's really, if you were boiled down to what were we doing at DeepMind and Google, and what I'm trying to do is, is find that limit. Next, the host asks Hasabis how he plans to control AI if it spirals out of control. And to be honest, it felt like he didn't really have an answer to that. He couldn't really give any proper kind of explanation, which suggests that the big tech still has no clear idea on how to control any advanced AI. In terms of the, the AI that people have access to at the moment, I, I know you said recently how important it is not to build AI to maximize user engagement, mm. just so we don't repeat the, the mistakes mm. of, of social media. But I, but I also wonder whether we are already seeing this in a way. I mean, people spending so much time talking to their chatbots mm. that they end up kind of spiraling into self-radicalizing. Yeah. Um, how do you stop that? How do you build AI that, that puts users at the centre of their own universe, yes. which is sort of the point of this in a lot of ways, but without creating echo chambers of one? Yeah, it's a very, you know, um, careful balance that, you know, I think is one of the most important things we, that we as an industry have got to get right. Mm. So I think we've seen what happens with uh, you know, some systems that were overly sycophantic or, you know, then you get these these sort of echo chamber reinforcements that are really bad for the person. So I think part of it is, and actually this is what we want to build with with Gemini, and I'm really pleased with the Gemini 3 persona that we had a great team working on and I helped with too personally, is um, just this sort of almost like a scientific uh, personality that's um, it's warm, it's helpful, it's light, but it's 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 succinct to the point, and it will push back on things in a friendly way that mm -hmm. don't make sense, you know. Rather than trying to reinforce you, you know, the idea that the Earth's flat and you said it, and it's like wonderful idea, you know. I don't think that's good in general for a society if that were to happen. Um, but you've got to balance it with what people want because people want uh, these systems to be supportive, um, to be helpful with their with with their ideas and their brainstorming so you've got to get that balance right and i think i think we are we're sort of developing a science of of personality and persona of like how to 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 kind of measure what it's doing and where do we want it to be like on authenticity on humor you know these sorts of things and then you can imagine there's a kind of base personality that it ships with and then everyone has their own preferences you know do you want it to be more humorous less humorous or or more succinct or more verbose people like different things so you add that additional personalization layer on it as well but there's still the core base personality that everyone gets right In, which is trying to try and adhere to the scientific method which is the whole point of these if, when we want people to use these for science mm -hmm. and for medicine and health issues and so on uh, and so um i think it's 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 part of the science of getting these uh, large language models right. And um, I'm, I'm quite happy with the direction we're going in currently.